little bit about me for most of you. I think only a few people had me in a class. I am Gretchen Hendrickson. <laughs> Silence yourself on the class. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks for the I knew that was going to happen. Uh, I'm Gretchen Hendrickson. I am a professor of quantitative psychology. Um, for those of you outside of the psych psychological world, I really don't. People are not my focus per se. Research approaches and techniques are my kind of focus. So I have a, a very strong uh, background in mathematics. Um, and uh, a foundation in theoretical statistics and applied statistics. So uh, nobody wakes up in the morning saying they want to do that. It's a long path. And maybe through your questions, you'll see where my path went. Um, uh, I was a traditional four-year student undergrad, first generation in college, uh, low SES. And then when I graduated from undergraduate, I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I'm sorry, Dr. Maybe they didn't know SE. So, um, socioeconomic status, so we, I was poor. Um, poor, first generation, and um, not really much resources at home to help me and motivate me to go further or do things. So I took about 10 years off after I graduated my undergraduate degree. Uh, I started off as pre-med, I wanted to be a veterinarian, and then I met biology, and biology was not my friend. Um, so I have a, an undergraduate degree in sports medicine, so basically human movement, um, uh, anatomy, uh, kinesi kinesiology, biomechanics, that kind of thing. Um, and then I did a lot of different jobs before I decided I wanted to go back to school. I worked at a zoo for five years, that was probably my biggest job. I worked as a, a VISTA volunteer, is anybody familiar with the, VISTA, the Federal VISTA? It's uh, related to AmeriCorps, it turned into AmeriCorps, so it was volunteers in service to America, and it was like Peace Corps for the United States, so I did that for two years um, with the prevention of child abuse in Indianapolis. Um, and I got the nickname the Child Abuse Lady, which was not good. <laughs> um, and then at the zoo, I decided I wanted to go back to school and did a master's degree and a PhD, and along the way found and discovered psychology and then statistics through that path. Um, I'll leave it at that because some of the questions are going to help you understand and all. Let me help you not make the mistakes that I made. I mean, quite a few. Um, so if one of the first questions that somebody wrote was, what was the hardest thing about going to school as a first generation college student as it relates to academics and family life? Um, I think the hardest thing was when I was doing my coursework, I'd go home for breaks and nobody really understood what I was doing. Um, and they, what are you doing? And I try to explain it, and then I get the, okay, uh, yeah. And then after I was in school for the first four years, I did it like everybody else did. And when I went back ten years later, uh, I started in 1998 for my graduate program, and I didn't graduate until 2011 with my PhD. So long, it was a long, windy road. Um, and people kept asking, when are you going to be done, when are you going to be done, and then they stopped asking, when am I going to be done? So that was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and then I graduated, finally when they stopped asking. So I, I would say it's not really having a resource when I have to make those hard decisions about what class I should take, what order I should take it in. Um, I relied a little bit on faculty members, and some of the other questions asked about that. Um, but for the most part, it's down to you making the decision, and there's really no good decision, because it's either two really great opportunities and you have to pick one, or two really not so good op choices you have to make, and you just pick one. Um, I would say with the information you have at hand and follow your heart, that's the best you can do, and that's um, adult issue number one in life. There's welcome to, I don't know what to do and nobody can provide you the answers. Um, yeah. Some of my family really appreciated education and some of my family really thought it was stupid. And so that was a hard thing to fight. I would just say, um, try to find those ally allies or those uh, nurturing places where people really appreciate education. Um, because in the long run, it does pay off. Um, there's not one job that I did outside of academics that would have benefited from what I learned. So. Uh, another question, what's the quickest way for students to upset or irritate professors? Anybody want to take a guess? Not showing up. Cell phone? 
Yeah, uh, cell phones is really a personal issue. I I kind of like it when they go off because that means somebody brings food to the class. Um, I'm, I'm partial to donuts or burritos, but um, I would say the number one thing is not following directions or reading things thoroughly. I would say 80 to 90 percent of success at undergraduate is just meeting the deadlines, following directions, and reading carefully. That's the, that's the hardest part. Um, at least in my experience. I'm trying to think of what else irritates. Um, I, I, I have heard of some faculty, not all faculty, if your uh, position or your uh, approach to a paper is different than what they think would be appropriate, that might be an issue for some faculty members. For, for example, a topic, maybe you pick a topic and um, the class material seems to be uh, not in favor of that position, but you have evidence in journals or resources to support your position, you might run into some walls, but I would say stay your course, whatever you feel comfortable with, because it's going to, in the long run, benefit you. Um, might be a way to uh, irritate a professor. I'm not sure. It's weird. I went to a Quaker school, so it's really hard to irritate Quakers. <laughs> Um, if you know anything about Quakers. Um, what is the most difficult or least enjoyed part of teaching at an institution? I think it's the administration work. So having, so I'm on a, the chair of the handbook committee, so all of the, the procedures that faculty have to go through for tenure and promotion or dealing with students has to go through our handbook process and I'm kind of in charge of making sure that the group of people monitor that and make sure the updates are made and make sure the process seems what we want it to, to do. Um, that's the, the least enjoyed part in faculty association meetings where we just sit there and to listen to each other talk about all the changes that are making to all the different programs. Uh, we'll listen to what we should I would just say, although I enjoy my, my peer faculty members, sometimes they can be a little difficult um, to listen to. I'm going to take a break here. Any questions, though, did I, on those three questions, did I touch on something and I didn't quite answer what you intended, or any follow-up questions from what I said? Anything I say sound familiar? Yeah. From being a first generation student, do you feel sometimes it's like underprepared for coming to college because it's like, at least in my mind, like, you know, uh, I had aunts married to the family who are teachers, but it, like they came in later on in my life, and so I really didn't get to, you know, hear about like, what is college. You know, I know you get to go get a degree, you have a better chance of getting a job, but it was more of a, um, you, you go, we want you to go do this so that we can brag about you, but then like when you come home, we're just like not going to understand anything you're saying anymore. Yeah, um, it's, it's a tough one, but I would say one of the best things about college is once you walk through the door into the classroom, everybody's on an equal plane. The professor doesn't know your background. The professor doesn't know your relatives. What they know is what you bring to the classroom, and so um, I've met quite a few students who felt like they were just so far behind they could never catch up and I had to remind them, no, everybody's pretty much behind at this point because I've scared everybody, especially in statistics. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> but my, um, uh, it's a little bit on purpose so that everybody's kind of made aware that we're going to do some serious work in the class, but that if you stick with it, it'll pay off. And you, can, you can attest to that. I mean, you never thought that that class would open some doors for you. Yeah. And you had a great summer. Yeah, I had yeah. a summer. What was your um, original motivating factor to actually go to college since you didn't really have that influence? I, um, that's a great question. I was one of these children that I read cereal boxes, everything on a cereal box. I could not read something. I also, I had fidgety fingers. And I would, in our household, we had a, a rotary phone that was owned by the phone company. You didn't have your own phones. 
and I would take it apart. I was also a, a latchkey kid, so my mom worked with single parent, and she worked a lot. So I would take the phone apart and put it together without her knowing it. And one day she came home, and it was across the entire front room floor. And she got really upset because it was like almost $800 to, to replace that phone because you didn't own it. You rented it from the phone company. And she was just panicked, where am I going to get $800? I was like, Mom, just give me a second. I'll put it back together. And she was just like, oh. So she stopped asking me. <laughs> so I kind of knew that to keep my, I just knew I was going to go. I just didn't know how I was going to be able to afford to go. And fortunately, in the state of Indiana at the time that I went to college, they offered a grant program that made private schools the same price as public institutions. So I got a really hefty grant to go to a very nice private school, um, not knowing that that private school had some of my family history. Uh, I had a, a great grandmother who was a Quaker minister, and I didn't know anything about that. And my mom was very good at keeping that from me, so it wouldn't influence my decision. So it's, it's funny how life comes circular. But yeah, it's, uh, I just she, my mom knew I was going to go to college. Um, she was a little bit jealous because she got pregnant at a young age and didn't have the opportunity to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I was coming home and doing things, there was a little friction in that. So I don't know if you have had parents who thought about going to college and then just couldn't go. And they want to talk about it and then they get kind of upset because they yeah. feel like they missed out on some of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, 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 it's rough. Good question. Any other questions before I go to the question box? How am I doing? Loud enough so everybody can hear? Um, how did pursuing grad school as a first-generation college student differ from the transition to college? Uh, it's a great question, and this um, brings up the whole mentoring thing. In undergraduate, I had a couple professors have conversations with me outside of class, trying to mentor me, and I just was 19, 20 years old. Didn't, I knew what I was doing. I really didn't need mentoring. Um, and then when I went back to school, for grad school, I really recognized that outside of class, talking to professors was really important. And I really liked some of my professors and really engaged them in conversations and it helped me. Um, and through those conversations, they kind of felt me out and uh, in a sense gave me the golden keys by saying, oh, did you try this? Or have you looked at this? Did you do research? Um, and then when I said I wanted to go to grad school and I wanted to, uh, like, not just my master's, but get a PhD. Um, there was there were some hurdles thrown my way. They were like, oh, it's really hard. And I think some of them didn't think I was capable of doing the work. And when I got that feeling, it motivated me more to make it happen. I've always been, and my, one of my motivating, to go back to the my undergraduate, my uh, father, he uh, divorced my mother when I was seven. He always kind of threw it around that I would be pregnant by the time I graduated high school and never finished high school, so I always kind of wanted to sh shut him down a little bit. So that's another um, better college. So, um, so that transition um, from undergraduate to graduate school really was helped by some professors opening their door, me going and, and seeking some extra help outside of class, which is really hard when you don't know how to do it. You think everybody else knows how to do it, and nobody really knows how to do it. They just do it. Just do it. It seems so easy, but it's really hard. But trust me, every time a professor says no, there were three or four professors who welcome you in to talk, talk to you if you haven't done that. How many of you have actually gone to a professor outside of class? Other than office hours? Or Other than office hours, just... Sometimes. So was it received well? Yeah. And you haven't gone outside of office hours? What's, what stops you? Usually they have class and they leave campus. Right? Ah, the closed door. Yeah. Yeah. I was, during my master's uh, degree, known to sit outside of their door and I could hear that they were in there and wait for them to come out to talk to them. Which I would encourage at least once in your career because <laughs> it's really beneficial. They stop closing their door because they know they can't get around you and they just let you in earlier, which saves you time in the long run. But anybody else do that? Sit outside an office door until they came out? I have. You have? I have. Yeah, and did it benefit? Where, was it? Yeah, it did benefit. Now do they not close their door as much? 
Um, I mean, I've still seen the closed door, but I've been able to get a hold of them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they know you're not going to go away. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good um, uh, reputation to have as a student, I think. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, another thing that happened during the transition was I found out that other people who had family who had gone to college were supported with working with others outside of class and not doing it all on your own. Um, and I think that is, if you don't get through college by yourself. You don't get through grad school by yourself. But somehow, when you're first generation, you think that that's how everybody does it by themselves. And that's not true. Uh, the sooner you ask for help, or the sooner you seek support for your work, the more you kind of understand that it's a village that gets you through college, it's not by yourself. And that you don't get an extra award for being, doing it all by yourself. And that's a hard thing to kind of ask for or recognize. Um, in my stat class, too, you know this, right? Working together helps outside of your head. Mm -hmm. But you don't like to do it, right? Sometimes. Yeah. If, have you done this yet? You should, really should. Do you know Kelsey? Hi. <laughs> so now you have a resource to talk to so that their eyes don't cross when you're saying, hey, this, this sums of squares, am I doing this right? She understands. <laughs> All right. Um, what's a time when a mentor helped you and how did having a mentor help you? Uh, in grad school, again, is a professor I really enjoyed. He was an industrial organizational uh, psych professor. He was also a human factor psychologist. And that kind of psychologist develops things. So for example, this phone. Some psychologist has sat down and talked about how a person right-handed and left-handed, how it works in a human hand. That's human factors. Uh, the remote controls in the classrooms that look like peanuts. If you put it in your hand, it fits appropriately because they have the average size of a hand. That's human factors. How do uh, humans interact with their environment and how do we make it more human friendly? Um, I really loved that class, the way he taught it, um, his approach to things, and it really opened my eyes to think about things. He was also the one that was really, didn't think I could handle grad school. Um, so I knew him for about three years, and I asked him for a, a recommendation letter for grad school. He gave me some hurdles, because I didn't ask, can you write a good recommendation letter, I said, could you write a recommendation letter? And that's one piece of advice he gave me. He was like, you know, the next one you ask, you should ask for a good recommendation letter, not just a recommendation letter. Mm -hmm. So I was really worried for a long time that I was, that would hurt me. Um, but then I had a couple other professors who saw I was just really engaged with statistics, which was, yay, <laughs> who does that? And uh, they really helped me kind of uh, find my favorite place to go. Um, and how do you know you found a topic that you really enjoy? You know? It's when you sit down to do 10 or 15 minutes worth of work, and you sit there and you work, and the next time you look up, two hours has passed and you don't even notice. That's when you found that thing that you love. Does that happen to you yet? Okay. Sometimes. Has it happened to you yet? Thanks. Not yet. Keep <laughs> looking. Has it happened to you yet? What's your, what subject? My car. Yeah. What, what, what subject area? Psychology. <laughs> How about you? Not yet. Not yet? And has it happened? Brooke. I'm sorry, oh, sorry. Brooke. No. Brooke. 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 Has it happened for you yet? Not yet. Um, do you have a major yet? Communication. Well, I'm sure Dr. Ford Brown will help you out there. <laughs> She's also um, feels some of your pain. She's very involved with SSS. And, understands what, how hard it is to go home and talk about school when people don't really get it. Uh, so that's how a mentor has helped me. Did any questions, any follow-ups, comments? I, I sort of do have yep. a question. So if I'm a student and I don't, well, once I decide my major, how would I go about deciding which one of my professors I want to be my mentor? And do I actually come out and say, would you be my mentor? Yeah, you can, you can do that. You can actually come out and say, will you be my mentor? Um, fortunately, here at Columbia College, for the most part, faculty really don't own a student. We're small enough that we really kind of share a student. So I would suggest 
you go to a, a faculty member that you've had a class with that you really kind of connected with and ask them if it would be okay to switch to, to them being your advisor. And you can do that on Cougar Track yourself. You don't need to ask anybody except for the professor. Um, you don't want to do it blindly because if they already have like 15 or 20 students that are their advisees, they might be like, whoa. Um, but ask them first and most nine times out of 10, they're gonna say, yeah, yeah, that's what we're here for because they really enjoy talking with students. Um, and so you would you assume then that your advisor would be your mentor? Yes, and so the way it works at Columbia College, we have general advisors if you're not decided yet or if you're new to Columbia College, they just give you a general advisor. But as you get to know the institution, you wanna get somebody in the, that department as soon as you possibly can because they'll be able to help you out with some of the difficult decisions. For example, um, if you have a, a semester where you know you have to work or there might be other commitments outside of school that would cause a little friction, maybe you should take a lighter load in some of the content classes and they might know which class has more work or less work to help you with that semester. Or if you have to make up a class because you didn't get the grade you wanted in a previous semester so you're getting, what, 18 hours of kind of an overload? That's the that's not that's the maximum we can get for without overloading. Not over eighteen. So if you're taking eighteen hours instead of fifteen hours that semester, they might help you with kind of juggling the coursework or interspersing your gen eds. Don't try to take all your gen eds at once because you need some of those later on in your junior and senior years to give yourself a break. You don't want to be all your major all the time. Because I decided late. Um, but they, I think the. It is kind of assumed here at Columbia College that if you switch to somebody to be your advisor, they're somehow mentoring you, and that's, um, we know that. Uh, we also know that what comes along with that is writing recommendation letters in the future. So don't be afraid to ask for recommendation letters. That's part of our job. I know a lot of students are afraid to ask. Again, it's that help thing, but that's how we got to where we are. We had to ask people, so ask us. So what else, maybe? What a mentor do for you? Um, tell you stories about their college career to make you feel less alone. Um, you probably, it's some, some faculty are easier to get going on their stories than others. Um, but I always try to make it connected to the material. And I, it helps students of all, it, it just helps students to know that they're not alone in, in that kind of situation. Um, kind of tagging off of that, wouldn't you say that some students have mentors and maybe don't even know it? Because yes. a mentor doesn't have to look like a, hey, I'm giving you this piece of advice directly kind of thing? Absolutely. If you're in a classroom before class, the five or so minutes before class, um, and a faculty member is asking you questions, they're mentoring you. You just don't know. There might be something about your work that they really appreciated and they're trying to open a door for you and whether you take it or not is up to you. Because um, there are some faculty who are just as shy as you are, right? Uh, I am typically not a, 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 I'm a psychologist and I don't even remember the personality type. Extrovert. I'm not an extrovert, I am totally an introvert. But because I learned from getting outside of my comfort zone um, in certain instances like this one, I know it's, I know why you're here and I, it's valuable to me and I want to share. Uh, the first day of class is nerve wracking for me. I get so, I'm so excited. You guys should be inside of my head when you guys are there for the first day. It's just like, oh my gosh, I'm terrified. Don't say the wrong things. <laughs> and I can't say anything for stats because I have to give you that test the first day. I get a test in stats class on the machine. We terrified you terrified everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but you and I, but I told you why after. Yeah, right. I kind of figured out what it was for. Yeah. for but. Um, but I'm just like crawling out of my skin. I go home and I'm exhausted the first day because I'm just, I, I really, really want you guys to, to be energized, but I also am like, oh my gosh, this is all this public speaking that I really don't want to do. <laughs> it's, in my head, it's just a scary place to be. Um, I was the youngest of six by seven years, so really, and I had twin sisters. Nobody really cared what I had to say about things. So I just got used to being in my own little world, taking things apart. And I feeling like that's going to know too much about me. 
Uh, did I, this question is, when did you first think about going to grad school and getting your PhD? Did I answer that one yet? Okay, so you remember I did my four-year degree and then I took some time off. I took like 10 years and I worked at a zoo. It was in my fifth year of working at the zoo when I was carrying from the UPS truck a vial of elephant sperm. <laughs> and I was asking myself, do I really want to do this? Randomly pick things up from the UPS truck and ask myself, why am I carrying these things? And I thought, maybe I should go back to school. So I, I started taking an evening class. And when I look back at my undergraduate, I was like, what class did I not take? Because clearly I didn't find the thing that I loved yet. And I had only had one undergraduate class in psychology. And it was in my minor, which was education. I was an education minor. Um, and it was ed psych. And I was like, hmm, I never had a general psych class. Maybe I should take that. So that was my first evening class that I started taking. Um, and then I went back the next semester. And after that semester, I decided to go back full time. So I quit my, quit my job and took out some loans to go back full time because I just knew that was not what was meant for me working at the zoo forever. Um, I had a thought and now it's gone. sometimes overactive synapses. Elephant sperm, I know I was at elephant sperm. Learned a lot of interesting things about elephants. We had African elephants at the Indianapolis Zoo, and it was the first time that they had successfully inseminated African elephants outside of the wild. And come to find out there was a special anatomy in the female elephants that prevented any insemination um, prior to this technique. And it was through trial and error they found a, a flap that is inside the female vagina of the elephant. And then if you lift the flap, then insemination can happen. And without the flap being flipped up, nothing happens. Who knew, right? There was a paper published about it. Um, I chose to be that guy. <laughs> like, yeah. And there was a whole team. I mean, these elephants were, they, they would take their blood and, and you know their hormone levels. And do you know how long elephants are pregnant for? Two years. Two years. 18 months. And they're, they're, they're African, African elephants, so the baby was like, what, three to 500 pounds? That's not, yeah. Um. So, like, how, so that just pushed you saying, I'm, this isn't for me. So, yeah, and then I started taking psychology, and then through psychology, um, I started taking more and more psychology classes. I really liked it. And then I had to take a stats class because it was required for the psychology, right? So I ended up taking every undergraduate psychology class that the university offered. And through that, I was like, I want to go to grad school. So I was um, recuperating from a GPA that wasn't the greatest for my undergrad. I graduated, but it wasn't stellar. Uh, so I applied to their master's program, which was kind of a in-between. Uh, so if you go to a terminal master's, some programs are designed to help you go on to a PhD. It's kind of a do-over and allowed me to get some graduate level uh, psychology under my belt. And doing that, they also required you to do statistics, one class, and I was like, I really like this stuff. So I took all of the stat classes that that university offered at that level. So when I applied to the PhD programs, I applied to the University of uh, New Mexico quant program, quantitative psych program. There's only like 20 in the country. And the guy called me up and was like, why do you want to come here? You've taken all the stats. What can we offer you? And he was one of these um, human factors uh, psychologists who had developed for air airplane cockpits uh, a device that helped when there was smoke in the cockpit that plant pilots could see out the window. Do you know what that device is? It's in every airplane. He's comfortably doing whatever he wants to. It's an inflatable plastic, clear plastic thing that then you push it up against the windshield and you put your eyes there and then you can see the smoke. So it's an inflatable thing that comes out of the cockpit so the smoke fills up. You can just see through the window, right? Simple. This is human factors. What can we do to help the human in an environment? Inflatable, clear plastic thing that goes up against the window. Um, so as soon as he said that to me, he was one of the people that I really, really liked uh, a stat book that he, that he and another professor had written. 
So I applied to the schools that they were at because I really liked what they were writing. And that's another thing that people don't tell you during undergraduate is look at the things you're reading and if you really like something, look at the person who read it or wrote it and see where they are. Just because your undergraduate degree might be in sociology doesn't mean you can't go to law school. It just means you might have to take some extra courses to get up to speed. Sometimes at the University of Missouri, I took uh, three, well, 15 hours of calculus as a PhD student, but it was undergraduate calculus. But that counted towards, right? Mm -hmm. who, who, who does that? And then a lot of my stat classes that were undergrads and grads taking it the same, they just made the graduate students do extra work in the class. So if you encounter anybody that says absolutely not or never, they're lying, because there's always an academics another way around things. Just don't take no for an answer. Right? Did I say something more? No, I just no. was not aware of that. We yeah, there's always, always somebody's signature that you can get or somebody that you can talk to with credentials or experience that might get you that uh, waiver or might open a door for you and say, okay, we'll invite you in on a probationary period take these classes, do well in those classes, and then the doors open for you. And there's always a way around that. Um, so yeah, I thought about my PhD for a long time, and I always knew I wanted to be an educator. I just didn't know what, and I never thought statistics. I never ever thought that that would be something I'd really enjoy. Um, is it too late to save a GPA? That's a trick question. Depends. Your school kind of has rules about the classes you take and how you can replace them. Um, there are some schools that may um, not put a grade down on a class, and then if you take it again, it shows up later on in your transcript. There are some schools like that. Columbia is not like that, right? Mm -hmm. You have it on your transcript twice, but the grade they calculate for your GPA is the second one. Right. The first one has an R. So they, they know so the first one they put an R instead right. of the grade. Yeah, some schools that class doesn't, or doesn't even show up. I'm not naming any names. Yeah, my first semester was a little rough. I had German, uh, mandatory humanities, so everybody took a three course series of writing. So it was content area, ours was American history and uh, social justice, kind of. So we read like 10 books in a 10-week semester and wrote a paper every week. That was one class. And then um, German, which was difficult. Lab and a lecture for German. And then I can't remember what my third class was. Maybe it was geology. It was a rough semester for me. It's my work-study job was 20 hours a week, supposed to only be 20 hours a week, uh, working as an athletic trainer. Turned out to be 40 hours a week. I only get paid for the 20, because I had to travel with the football team all the time, so I was never on campus, and my GPA tanked, because I wasn't in the library. This was before the internet, so you had to physically be in the library to get the resources. Nobody told me having a mentor would help me with that decision. Um, what are the benefits of having a mentor? learning from their mistakes, having access to the knowledge that they have. Um, sometimes a mentor is a really good fit and it's somebody who's had a similar background as you. Sometimes it's not a similar background, but that doesn't mean that they can't help you and understand or sympathize with where you're at. Um, it's shopping for a mentor is an okay thing. Let's say you pick a mentor or an advisor and after a semester or two it really doesn't seem like a good fit. It's okay to change. Don't think that somebody's going to get mad if you switch an advisor. Um, I know within psychology, it, we just want you to have a good fit. Um, I'm not sure about other majors. Any experience with other departments? Anybody pick a, a faculty member as an advisor and then switch? I kind of would like to. Um, I have Dr. James, and I really think of the Bagel, but Bagel I already has a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. But um, Dr. James does what he needs to, I'm not going to be picky. I just wanted somebody in the chemistry field, and then I just go to Dr. Phelps when I need that advising on my math degree. 
And that's a good thing. Um, here at Columbia College, we know one another, and we will say, hey, go talk to so-and-so, because I'm not sure I'm outside of my comfort zone. And so really, um, your mentor doesn't have to be your advisor. Uh, you can get mentored by a lot of different people. And even sometimes not faculty can mentor you. Um, one of the, I teach INCC this semester, and one of my best advices I'm, I'm handing out to them is meet a new person every day. And you won't feel like Columbia isn't home because you know more people, and you never know that one person might open a door for you. Um, and you can't know too many people on a college campus. And, and all these nice books. If I'd sat in my office all the time, I wouldn't know you guys at all. It's very sad. It made me very sad. What's hot cakes? What's that? And Let's funnel cakes, <laughs> yeah, and hot dogs. <laughs> Any other questions that you have? <coughs> I feel like I rushed through them. One of the things on the GPA that we've talked to other, uh, when I was working with somebody from Stanford, they were talking about those GPAs trying to get into graduate programs. Oh. And they, they were mentioning that you might have a low GPA <coughs> because of that freshman year, but within your major, you might have a higher GPA and using that reference letter or something from somebody who could say, here's what I might be. Well, let me tell you about how you calculate your GPA for grad school. Um, they have you calculate it like two or three different ways. First is all your undergraduate, your average GPA. Then they will have you sort through your coursework and say, which is your major? So you have all your major coursework GPA. And then they'll ask you your last two years in your major GPA. That's when I got very happy, because I did really well in my major. If it wasn't in my major, I really didn't care about it, which was a bad attitude to have. Um, and so when they started looking into my um, paperwork when I applied to grad school, it took them a little while, a few schools, to really look, kind of shuffle through the information and see that I was really, really good and strong in my, my G major of psychology. Um, and that I had taken some really difficult courses and done very well in them. Statistics always looks well, I don't care what major, if you've done well in a stats class, it opens some doors for you. Um, and that I had taken multiple outside of what was required, they, they were just like, okay, come here. So I applied to six schools for grad school and three of them and uh, offered me without even seeing me to come, to come to grad school. I must tell you that at any given time, there's only 27 people in quantitative psychology graduate programs because nobody wants to go take calculus. Um, and that in any given year, there's only seven people that graduate with that degree. So it's not a very competitive uh, field, but the requirement, you, you have to be committed to get into it. So I kind of stacked my, stacked my basket a little bit. So when you're looking at your GPA and you're worried about it for grad school, look at the program and see how they have you calculate it because there might be multiple different calculations and a school has found that uh, maybe looking at the last two years in your major is the best predictor of your success in grad school. Does anybody know um, how many people start P uh, graduate programs and how many finish? What percentage finish? 50%? Yeah, it's a little less than 50%. I think it's like 40% finished grad school. Anybody want to know why? Any guesses why? How's this for like master's and PhD? Yep. Not prepared? How do you mean not prepared? Uh, time management and or reading focus? Life, right? <laughs> you might have a family and you think, oh, I could juggle my family and schoolwork and it's really, really difficult. And you need a lot of support to juggle that. And if you don't have that support, it's very easy to say goodbye to school. Um, the uh, hoops you have to jump through. There's a lot of pol politicking. There's a lot of doing something my advisor wants me to do. And I don't <coughs> buy ish And if you don't want to do that, um, graduate school will be very difficult for you. Um, if you want to be a professor, you kind of get used to doing that because it's the same thing when you're a professor. I just went up for uh, my pro promotion to uh, associate professor last year and it was all over again. They evaluated everything I'd ever done. So it's like every three to four years you're constantly being evaluated with everything you've, you've done. And it's all these hoops you have to jump through. And if you don't want to do that, then maybe grad school isn't a good decision. So if I'm not going to grad school, do I still need a mentor or could I benefit from one? You absolutely need a mentor. Because 
what we teach you in the classroom, or at least my approach is making sure that what you're doing in the classroom is something that you produce that helps you open doors in the job. So for example, in my statistics class, I teach a program that's really kind of difficult to learn. Uh, it's frustrating, um, it's time consuming. However, that program is used in the private sector and um, I have five students who have gotten jobs because they knew that program. So it's not something just for going to grad school. Or internships. Or internship, lots of internships opportunities because of statistics knowledge. That's what people, I mean, nobody wants to do data entry, but that opens doors for so many things. What did you do this summer? You counted fish or? Uh, I did some counting fish, but I also did some data entry. And I, they, they, what really surprised me when I said that I knew, all, knew some things about R, and they double checked my transcripts and saw that I had had two statistics courses already. Yeah. And the, those little second looks, maybe they don't want you to do it, but that tells you some, tells them something about you as a student or as a person who's willing to go and do the things above and beyond. Um, and pay attention to some details, perhaps, maybe. Uh, and so in writing, um, you might not have to do a research paper after your undergraduate, but knowing how to read one in the real world will get you opportunities. You may, may look, uh, make your boss look really good because you understand the statistics and everybody else is like, I don't even want to read it, I don't get it. Well, so-and-so knows statistics. Hmm, what other opportunities might we have for that person? Um, so you, having research methods may not seem like it helps you not going to grad school, school but it really does open doors. Um, understanding how our primary research article works, where to go for the important information, really important tools, um, especially, for example, in this uh, political year where you have political candidates throwing out facts and where are they getting this information, right? If they're, if they're citing a certain paper or a certain source and you don't know how to read that source, then you trust their interpretation. I teach skepticism. I want to see it myself. Show me how you got that and show me how you measured things because I don't trust you. I know you, then I can trust you. <laughs> but not in, a, not in a critical way, but just in a very um, safe, I don't want to commit myself to something that I don't know until I fully understand it. So I guess that's that answer your question. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm just thinking that um, those kinds of skills are really important even when you're purchasing things or all different kinds of things. Anytime you hear someone talk about it, statistical thing of any kind if you don't understand how they put that study together. Yep. How long did they, for medicines, how many people went into making sure that that medicine was safe? Was it tested on males and females or males only? Was it tested on kids or just adults or both? If or you how much of an effect it had versus placebo? Correct, correct. Um, yeah, placebo effect. Uh, shoot, there was something else I was going to say. What were we talking about? Um, buying things? And buy I'm cheap. I'm super <laughs> cheap. But when I buy appliances, I will go and buy top of the line appliances because I know I'm going to get twice as many years out of it. Just an FYI. Or tires for a vehicle. I will not be cheap on tires because that's the only thing keeping you safe. And I like my, my health, and so um, I don't buy cheap tires. I might buy cheap windshield wiper, which is probably not a good idea either. <laughs> but it just irritates me to pay so much for something that's only going to last a year. So that's a great transition to my car health, my health mm -hmm. oh. Teach, Teaching class on. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, and yeah, buy, I, I buy used cars, put good tires on it, and it lasts you longer. Buy a new car, and they, there's certain automobile companies that don't put very good tires on their cars. How did you, or boy, they put Continentals on there and it's not good, that's just not good. <laughs> 12,000 miles, they shred. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I make a deal with Continental, and the profit margins go up for the car. Crazy. Is there much feeling here, that, I don't know, I'm just asking, do you feel much difference between students here who aren't on scholarships or whose parents are paying for everything and they have a car and in your situation is that is there a class kind of consciousness here do you think 
at this school? I don't know, this is like some, sometimes I do hear people talking about like, oh, like, yeah, my parents covered this, or they covered this. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I've been paying for that. Yeah, I'm, you have a job, you, or like you can get a job to get some work experience. Because as uh, some of the career center posters say that employers don't hire GPA, they hire experience, and like your GPA looks good, like they also want you to have experience and it's, and so sometimes I'm just doing things on your own that extra without that extra help is just sometimes just like overwhelming makes you feel like you have more to juggle when it's just hey my phone bill make sure I have enough money to five, five minutes of time make sure I check my bank account for enough money but it's still do you feel it's intimidating at all about the the relationship you have with those students does that bother you anybody no problem Sometimes, but like it's like five, like five to ten percent. It's n never like a majority. No, I uh, I have friends with like all different walks of life and backgrounds, so I wouldn't say um, that I feel that there's some kind of class or difference, or I feel inferior to them. But um, I definitely there's like you know different mindsets and mentalities of you know oh well I actually have to you know work and go to school and take up this extra job, you know, to pay for my education, whereas, you know, maybe you're just here uh, based off of, you know, a relationship that your parent has with, you know, somebody that goes here and so you have a nice scholarship, you know, or, you know, whatever the case be. So it's just, yeah, different different mentalities and work ethics and things like that, values. I think it's easy to make, it, like you were talking about, with assuming that everyone is doing it on their own, it's easy to make the assumption that, oh, this person is going to have an easy time of it, and I'm not. And so often, I think we don't reach out to people because we think they're not going to understand where I'm coming from. Yeah, when I went to school, it was back in the day before technology, typewriter, I went with a typewriter. Mm -hmm. um, but I also went with no spending money. So once I paid for my books, I had zero extra money. So if I missed the meal for the day, I was hungry until the next meal. And my, the people I went to school with didn't know this until I just recently talked to a friend from 30 years ago. I was just like, if I had known. But when they ordered pizza or something like that extra that I didn't have money for, I just conveniently had to study. And I, I don't know how to support that. I mean, SSS is one place because there's it's a great resource. I didn't have anything like that. Um, but I think it was my junior year I started cutting hair to make extra money. But I couldn't call it hair cutting because you needed a license. Here. So it was hair sculpting. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds more difficult than yeah. <laughs> and the, the hard part was it was a dollar fifty a week to do laundry, seventy five cents to buy a ticket to do laundry, and I had to come up with laundry money somehow. And so, and it wasn't like I could bring. I didn't have a car to go home. So you get creative with doing stuff. But ask me. I didn't ask for help. I think there were people who would have helped me, but I just, it's hard part. But it makes you stronger. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. When you have to learn to juggle your job and your classes and anything else that you're doing, it, it makes you a stronger person. Really. Yeah, yeah. I joined athletics because they traveled, and it was free travel for me. I had never been further east than the Indiana Ohio border, um, and plus they fed you extra meals. So, and I made sure I could. I never missed dinner because I was on the team. So I played three sports. And was a trainer? Well, yeah, because uh, I traveled with the team then, and eventually by my junior year, I wasn't a trainer anymore. I had one of the cush jobs on campus, which was working overnight security, so I got paid to sleep. Or Until you actually had to secure something. I, yeah, I had to go to the security <laughs> office and sleep there overnight, one night a week, every week, so I got paid ten, 10 hours for eight hours of work. Again, cheap and ha efficient with my time, so I got paid for 10 hours and I worked eight hours. There were six of us that got a job. No, you had to know and talk to people, and that's how I found that job. The only easier job was putting the flag up and down. That was 10 hours a week, and all you had to do was make sure it was up at dawn, down at dusk, and then it was not up in the rain. That was your job. So they didn't have a waterproof flag? Well, it's not, you're not supposed to leave the flag out in the rain. Flag is. Yeah. yeah. I wish faculty had more insight to the jobs on campus, and it's changed, hasn't it? 
campus jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, like, like work study versus work program. Some people don't know all the jobs that you don't need to be work study to have. Like the two, yeah. the two tutoring jobs I have, excluding the one that I have for SSS, you can be work program because my the funds I get paid with come from the math center and the writing center. If international students knew that, because a lot of international students are looking for jobs, but the only, only thing they hear is that you can either do the international center or the late meet. And then they just recently found out they can also work in tech services, or like working in the math center or working in the writing center. Yeah. The problem is a lot of departments don't have funds to hire students, work program funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to take it out of their own budget, but mm -hmm. it sometimes is a problem. But now they have a limit of 20 hours a week they can only work their total number of jobs on campus. Yeah. Unless they're an RA, it's a little different. Yeah. And it used to be an on-campus job was you brought work to do, like your homework to do a little bit. Mm -hmm. But that's not so much anymore. No. You're not like when I work for financial aid, they always, almost always had something for me to do. If anything, they're like, well, we can go home early. Or, yeah. So this is where technology has kind of uh, come back to, to bite us a little bit because um, we had a desk in front of every dorm that managed the messages for everybody and you took handwritten messages and put them in mailboxes for people because there was only one phone for a whole wall. Rooms didn't have phones. So it made a lot of jobs that you could sit there and do your homework and just answer the phone. Now we don't need them anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, the big, yeah, old way. When they lock the door, my door, and then after one o'clock, they lock you out. And we had, yeah, they were in big trouble. Yeah. So you used to quake school, they didn't have to do that because they don't behave. Right. <laughs> <laughs> shoot an email to one of these folks and they'll get it to me, don't ever hesitate to ask questions. I'm always open to helping my fellow students out to not struggle because it's, uh, it's hard to be out there by yourself. So they don't have to sit outside your door? When you, when you come well, they can sit outside my door because I'll probably be there. I'm there around 7.30 in the morning, unless I'm going to Ernie's. I treat myself once a week to Ernie's breakfast. And then, um, so meet you at Ernie's. They could be at Ernie's. <laughs> tell the people there that you're waiting for Gretchen and they'll give you some coffee and tell you that I'll be in. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. No, I, thank thank you. you. If there's anything else, uh, any other topic, or you want me to, to hook another faculty member in, let me know. <laughs> you turn the camera and say the meaning of life's 42. The meaning of life's 42. I heard it was 63. <laughs> 42. 42. Hitchhiker's Guide. Pardon? Hitchhiker's Guide of the Universe. Oh, right, see, yes. My, but that way, if somebody watches this, we'll know if they're going to be there. My graduate uh, mentor's advisor was always asked, How many people do I need for my sample? And he always said 63. So that's where I come up with 63. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of studies in the like late 70s, early 80s that have a, a sample size of 63 because he said so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah, what's the drawing? Just do it now. Do it now. Do it now. I don't want to hear it. Well, we can price it down. It's okay. They can come out. Yeah, great. Sign in over there. Put a name on e-tag. We have somebody who needs to put her name in. Wait, one more name. Let's be fair. Did you get the results? Oh, Easton, too. Easton, too. They didn't have the right to worry about it. They only get one ticket if they didn't ask a question. No. It was interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. You probably know more about elephants than you ever want to know. Well, yeah, that's probably true.